How many of you may recall a musical called A Funny Thing Happened to Me on the Way to the Forum? It's a story of a slave seeking his own liberation and freedom. In an effort to do so, he is trying to be a matchmaker and bring together this young virgin and his smitten master, only to find that this is the journey for his liber liberation. Well, today's text that you read just a little earlier is a little bit just like that. It's about discovering our own liberation. It's the journey of us discovering and finding our own perfect journey to peace. That perfect place that we'd like to be at where all is at rest. Discovering our own liberation from all the cares and the worries of this world. Well, today's text that you read may seem a little strange because it's a story of the lepers coming to Jesus and seeking healing. Yet they're seeking their liberation in a unique way. When we look at this, we find that there is a wonderful truth that is being unfolded for us. In this passage of Scripture, we find hidden within it a deeper meaning because we are metaphysical people. We don't look at Scripture just from the physical or from the literal or from the black and white. We look for the deeper meaning, the meaning that's metaphysical, meaning beyond the physical, in the spiritual. We want to unfold the truths that are hidden deep within every text because there's wonderful nuggets that are there. It's not just another historical story of Jesus going on his way to Jerusalem and discovering someone who needs healing. Sometimes we look at those passages and think, okay, that's lovely, that's good for Jesus, what's it about for me? That's the whole intention of Scripture is that there is something important for us, something powerful for us that we're to learn from each one of these passages. It's not just simply historical reading, but let's look deep in and discover the very truths that there, because there is a liberating truth that's found within all of the themes of Scripture, and that is that we are an offspring of God. And the, being that offspring, we are one with God. I don't know if we can grasp the full extent of what this means for us, that we are the child of God. We are the revelation of God. We are the offspring of the divine, spoken into existence, created by that divinity and that power, brought into this world for a purpose that we might be the revelation of God that we might be that which is moving in this world and revealing to each and every one the very power, presence, the love, the grace, the mercy, the very essence of all that is divine. Yes, we must awaken to God in us, God through us, God around us, God for us, and us as God, us, you, me, as the revelation. This is something that is a beautiful, liberating truth for us because it sets us free from all kinds of cares and worries that we may be struggling with. When we think about our own individual journey of our life that holds us into bondage with fears and doubts and questions, that the liberating truth is you are the revelation. The divinity is flowing through you. God is at work in you and around you at all times. You have nothing to fear but you have everything to claim for your own. And that's the powerful passage that allows us to be liberated and set free from any kind of bondage. Yet we struggle with this idea that we're the revelation of God. What is God? What is this divine source? What is this infinite good? What is this that we call spirit? I wanna encourage you to get accustomed with different names and terms that describe what God is to you. Because so often we are very limited with the phrases and terms that we may use that describe the very characteristics of the divine. It is true that the more you know someone, the deeper you're in relationship with them, the more names you have for them, the more intimate you are. Yes, when I met Mr. Robert Mixon, my life partner, he was Robert Mixon to me at first. Mr. Mixon, interior designer. Mr. Mixon by these titles. As the weeks went on, he became just Robert. As the months went on, he became Bobby Lamar in my southern moments. <laughs> he became Pookie and Honey Buns. He became all kinds of endearing terms, beloved. He became all kinds of wonderful things because he moved on. He was no longer Mr. Mixon. He was no longer Robert. He was beyond that. There were endearing terms that were shared that spoke of our intimacy and our love for one another in unique ways. So it is with God. Do we just call them our Father, do we just say, oh God, that Holy One in the sky? What are the terms that speak of our intimacy, 
So it's encouraging, I'm encouraging you to find these, discovery of way, uh, discover a new way of expressing what is the divine at work within you? What might be new terms for you? For God is everywhere, and when we speak of God, we speak of the universe. The whole universe is God. What do we say? There is not a spot where God is not. Oh, good. There is not a spot where God is not. You've got it. That God is everywhere. God is in all things and in all people and in all uh, areas of this world and this universe. All is God. So will you be comfortable with expressions that truly describe God in unique terms for who and what is God? God is not a man, not confined to one place, but God is this wonderful awareness of I am. Now, that may be kind of difficult for us to say, ooh, that just doesn't fit right, doesn't roll off our tongue when we think about I am. Calling God the I am, what is this really all about? It may be so difficult for us. But Moses discovered to, to God to be man's awareness of being. Discovering the I am was the very power and essence. When we break this down and understand this truth, we understand that Moses, in his experience, questioning Who do I go to the Pharaoh in? What power do I go in the Pharaoh in? What name, what character do I go in? And in that moment, the universe speaks to him through that burning bush, proclaiming the I am that I am is what sends you. This is where you go forth. In essence, Moses understands that you are as you believe you are. You are, you have, you possess all that you have uh, consciousness of. You know, if you don't believe it, if you don't have conscience of it, do you own it? No, you don't. Because you are that which you believe. You are that which you're conscious, that which you're aware of. It's interesting that a lot of people sometimes are not always conscious or aware of some of the wonderful talents they have, some of the wonderful capabilities and some of the great gifts that they have. So because they're not conscious of them, they're not aware of them, They kind of slip through life with never utilizing to the fullest. Then one day someone says, you know what? I didn't realize I had a knack for this. I didn't realize I had a talent for this. I didn't know I was gifted at this. And suddenly there's this consciousness and discovery that suddenly transforms their life. They're aware of something and that transforms them. And this is the awakening within our life. Man awakening to the wonderful awareness of I am. Jesus said, I am the light. I am the bread, I am the truth, I am the way. Not Jesus saying, Jesus saying, I am, I, Jesus, am the way. He's saying the I am is the way. The I am, this consciousness, this awareness is going to be the life for you, the way for you, the truth for you, is going to be the light for you. All of this, when we dawn and when it dawns on us, when we awaken to us, that there is a consciousness that we're called to come to, an awakening that says, wow, you within you are already equipped with all that you need for this universe, for this moment, for this time. Everything you need is already there. Awaken to it. Because you have far more within you than what you may give yourself credit for at this moment. Far more within you than you may even realize. So begin to awaken. I am. I am. I am for the divine is this consciousness, this power within me, this presence within me that's unfolding. I am. It is our consciousness. It is that which calls us to truly be aware as Jesus, as Moses were. Because this consciousness is this resurrecting power that brings new life to us every single moment when we are aware of the divinity at work within us. Now, man and women, men and women, are ever outpicturing what they're conscious of. You're ever unfolding what it is you're conscious of. You are drawing to you what you are conscious of. And when we are conscious of the divinity within us, more of it unfolds. How beautiful that is. Isn't it great to know that there's no limit? You don't exhaust the love of God in you. You give out love and there's more to give. You give out grace and there's more to give. There's more and more of all of this unfolding within you for there's a fountain within you ever flowing in your life as you begin to allow it to come from you and express this in a great consciousness because that which you're aware of, you're drawing more to you. How powerful that is. I'm aware of God's blessing. 
Well, I'm drawing more of it to me. I'm aware of God's goodness. I'm drawing more of it to me. I am fully aware of healing for my life. I'm drawing more to me. When we are aware of all the power of God at work within us, conscious of it, thinking through it, working in it, and allowing it to be all around in our day-to-day life, the amazing experience is the dynamic power of God at work for us. If we give up these former beliefs in a God that's apart from us, removed from us. You know, so much we see in church can be all about an homage to a God up in the sky, God of distance. We go to sacred spaces and sometimes they're holy because they are built in traditions of people believing that we need to do something for a God up there to appease, to please, in some way to make happy because somehow God is not really loving us. God is in judgment, God is in punishment. God is eagerly questioning whether or not we are of value, you might say. We see so much of this in the world around us and how we might celebrate our spirituality in our lives. But when we give up this as Jesus and the prophets thought and believed, spoke and taught, it transforms our life to the realization that I and the Father, the divine source of all good, are one. There's no difference. There's no difference between the power and presence of God in you than there is in me. And when we understand that, it's so life transforming. When we understand God at work in us, that power in us, God is present in us, God is flowing through us, wow, our day is transformed because we can face these obstacles, we can come against things because we are now understanding we are one, there is no difference. It's like the wave of the ocean. The wave of the ocean does not say, oh, I'm all alone, I'm just one wave. I'm powerless, I don't know who I am. I don't know where I came from. Please, something outside me, help me along the way. The wave of the ocean knows it's part of the ocean, doesn't it? And every essence of the ocean is within the wave. That's why this truth is so simply illustrated for us and we must grasp it, to know that the divinity is within us, ready to unfold at any moment. But this great truth has been hidden down through the ages and lost. We've been missing the mark when it comes to understanding this. We've been missing it completely, and so we struggle. So today's story begins with Jesus on the way to Jerusalem. Now, we know that everything written in a gospel lesson has meaning. Not just writing historical uh, essence or describing a scenario from a historical perspective, but a deeper truth to be conveyed. What does Jerusalem mean? Well, Jerusalem symbolizes certainly the city or place of peace. For the word, the beginning aspect of Jerusalem, J-E-H-U, shortened from Jehovah, is the meaning of I am. When you couple it with the last part of Jerusalem, the salam means peace. Hence, Jerusalem means I am and shall have peace. I am shall have peace. When we acknowledge the I am, the divine within us, we'll have peace. How beautiful are so many scriptural texts about Jesus journeying to Jerusalem, Jesus coming to Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, the city of great peace. The symbolism for that is this awakening in our life when you realize the divine is within you, at work within you, you have peace. You have peace. I'm not afraid because God is at work. I'm not troubled. I'm not full of anxiety. I'm not uh, fearful. I'm not living in lack. I'm not any of these things. I'm at perfect peace. So the story begins to unfold with a symbolic message of Jesus on his way to Jerusalem. Yet he travels through the outer regions and he crosses through Samaria and Galilee. When we look at these symbolic messages there, Samaria stands for intellectual confusion. Excuse me, confusion. Samaria being that place where there were the mixing of Jews and Arabs together. The Jewish people in that saw that as kind of a confusing element for there are all these different traditions. The Jews believed in a purity and they wanted to see a, a purity of thought being acted out. So they looked at Samaritans as people of intellectual confusion being confused where they worship, what they do, how they act, all these mixture of cultures coming together. And for them, it was symbolic of that kind of confusion. Galilee really is the place of life activity. 
rural activities took place. Galilee is a very sort of uh, farmer's haven. Fields abound. And there, people were there were simple in life. It wasn't the, the location of great cities or a hub of activities. Galilee was more the rural setting. So Jesus now journeys through this place that symbolizes the activities of life. He's encountering this place on the road to peace. It's all about this kind of internal confusion. What do we see? We find Jesus encountering 10 lepers, 10 who come to Jesus crying out. We know that the lepers in ancient tradition were required to give testimony constantly. And the number 10 symbolically means those who give testimony or giving testimony. Wow, you see the correlation there and the beautiful scenario that's being unfolded for us as they're giving testimony. But what are they called to give testimony of? I'm unclean. Stop, don't come any closer. That's what the leper was called to do, to speak out constantly and say, don't come near me because I I have leprosy. Stay away. And here are the lepers giving testimony, calling out, yet at the same time they see Jesus. And they are crying out, have mercy upon me, seeking that healing power within their hearts and lives. Jesus doesn't heal. In fact, he says, go to the priests. Jesus enacts enacts within them the desire to go and act and move as if. How beautiful this is as they discover for these were symbolic, the 10 lepers of people who are living in dis-ease, disease, dis-ease. People who don't know the divine at work within their life are at dis-ease. They're not at peace. People who don't just know and understand the fullness and the truth that the God within you is the I am at work unfolding power, presence, might, unfolding wisdom, unfolding insight at work within you at all times. If you don't realize that, what's happening, you are like the leper. You're at dis-ease. You're in disease. You're in this place where you have to cry out, I don't get it. I don't understand it. How many people in five have friends who say, ah, I'm not into that religious stuff. I'm not into God. I'm not really don't care for that. You know, you may go to church. That's fine for you. It's not there for me. A discussion with a lady uh, whose uh, daughter's husband uh, is saying over and over again, you know, this religious stuff, it's fine for you, but please don't bring it into my family. Don't bring it into your grandkids. Don't try to teach it. He was constantly confused about who and what God is and not comfortable at all with spiritual conversation or prayer. He was at dis-ease, uncomfortable with understanding and knowing the God at work within him. So it is that this uh, journey of these 10 lepers coming to Jesus were those who were experiencing this feeling of being unclean, symbolizing that intellectual confusion, I don't know where I am, who I am, how I fit, symbolizing for our life as how we act. Because let me tell you this, when we act out in fear, or we act out with oppression, it's simply because we feel we're separated. We don't feel this divine connection. Those who feel that they're separated from God also feel they're separated from one another. It's very easy to be a racist when you feel like you're separated from God and when you feel like you're separated from one another. Because if I think that God is off in the distance and not dwelling within me, If I think I'm not the revelation of God, if I think that I am not the I am, that which I'm conscious of, of, if I think those things and I, I think I'm none of those things, well, then I am free to say, you know what? I'm here all alone. God is distant and far away. I don't care about you. I don't care about you. I have no interest in you. I'm looking out for myself only and for me only. It's very easy then for those who are separated in consciousness and removed from the very love of God, removed from this awareness within their own heart and life to then act out in ways that harm one another. 
to be people who cannot see equality and fairness and justice for all. It's easy for those who are separated to oppress someone else because they don't understand that we are all the divine. They don't understand this great spirit of oneness. So it's very easy to say, I can oppress you. I can uh, make your life miserable because I can step over you to climb on my ladder to try to get up and excel in the world. I can do those things because I feel so removed. But those who've discovered, those who've been awakened, those who found this perfect peace, those who come to this dawning that says the I am is who I am, a consciousness of the divinity within me. I am the child of God. I am created in God's being. I am in God's image. I am this revelation, and I'm the revelation of all that is God for the world to see and to experience. And when you do that and you think that, you think, Wait a minute, if I am that, you are too. There's no way I could be racist. There's no way I could be a per, an oppressor. There's no way I could bring harm to you because you and me were all together. There's no way I could alienate you. There's no way I could say that I'm better than you and you are less than. There's no way that I could pay you a different salary for doing the same kind of job. Hello? There would be some sort of equality consciousness happening within our world, wouldn't there? Because suddenly we would realize that we're, there is no separation. So this leprosy really represents us missing the mark. For our greatest error in life is to think and live and move in a way that says, I'm separated from God. Now, I grew up in a fundamentalist congregation. I grew up with the teaching that we are very separated from God that we have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. And God wants really nothing to do with us, but Jesus comes in to save the day. Jesus comes in to say, I'll build a bridge and I'll make a way for you because you're so unworthy. And God's out there to wanting to, eager to punish seemingly, to send you off to an eternity in hell, to send you to burning flames. And to live in that kind of error, wow, there was no peace in my life. I was always afraid. I was always scared. Oh, my Lord, I grew up in the teaching that Jesus was coming in the clouds at any moment. And so as a young child, if my parents were home, I was thinking, wait a minute, they were supposed to be home at four o'clock. My mom and dad aren't here. They're preachers. They're certainly going to heaven. And if they're not here and they're not home, did the rapture come and was I left behind? I'd run to the telephone and dial Mrs. Bridge. She was the saint of God in the church. If she said, hello, I hung up. Whew, I know the rapture hasn't come. I'm still good. I'm still good. All right. I can go back to living my old way, whatever I want. Five minutes later, that same fear could come into your life, and every day you're living by fear, thinking that God is somehow going to send you to hell. You know, I thought, how do we become, become saved and you never keep sinning? Because I looked and grew up in a world where I thought, you know what? We sin, we fall short of God's glory every single day of our life. I thought, I am not perfect. So I need to pray a salvation prayer every hour on the hour just to make sure because if Jesus comes and I wasn't saved and, you know, I had done something to disappoint God, well, then I needed to get resaved. And if I'd done something to disappoint God, I need to get resaved. And I need to go over and over again, constantly just re-proclaiming. I need to clean up my life constantly because I was so scared Jesus was going to come and I'd be left behind. There was no Jerusalem for me. There was no peace for me. There was a day-to-day -day journey of living in fear that a God who was out there would leave me behind. And when I discovered that error, when I began to look into scriptural understanding that God never leaves us nor forsakes us, yet my church was constantly telling us, you will be left behind. You will be forsaken. God will turn God's own back on you. When I realized that that's not at all the truth that's there, when I held on to that error for so long, I lived in that torment of my own individual life, but suddenly when I awakened to realize I need to let all of that go, let those false beliefs go, because that was sin, and sin is simply missing the mark. I was missing the target. I was missing the goal. I was missing the intention God had for my life was to realize I was created in the loving image of God and that the goodness of God is in me and I must allow it to flow from me. 
And when I began to realize that I am the goodness of God, not the badness of this world, but I'm the goodness of God, and I am worthy, and I am loved, and I am cherished, and I am valued, my whole life began to change, and my outlook began to change. So it is that these lepers symbolize those who are missing the mark, not seeing that they are truly the divinity of God in this moment, the revelation of God. For that sin simply means any human attempt to negate or distort these divine ideas, these divine ideas that you are loved, you are good, you are grace, full of grace, you are full of mercy, you are full of the ability to forgive, you have great patience, you have within you all the loving essence of God within you, but yet we have a world that wants to tell us, "Mm -mm, not you, not you, certainly not you. Just kidding. (laughs) Especially. (laughs) Just kidding, just kidding. We somehow believe that we can negate these divine ideas, these divine principles, or say that we can negate the very truth, the very aspects of God. Because when there's no compassion, We miss the mark. I'm going to tell you that. Because God is a God of compassion. And if you're not exuding compassion, if you're not sharing compassion, honey, you're missing the mark. If you are not exuding love and you're abusing others, you're missing the mark. If there's deceit in your words, if you are publicly lying, there is sin, you are missing the mark. When you speak in ways that are about greed and your inability to share, you're missing the mark. And we as people of God have to awaken to what really is sin. And we hear it all around. It's missing the mark. And there's so many people with great love, not with judgment, who don't quite get it. And they want to negate the power of love and grace and mercy and compassion at work within them that are the gifts of God. They don't realize they're the revelation of God. They allow their ego and their self-advancement to be there at the expense of others. And there is no equality or fairness or there is uh, simply an impartial, uh, uh, a partiality that's expressed that says one is better than the other, that we favor one group over the other. These are not attributes of God. They're not attributes of God. And when we see them in our world, we need to call them out. This is not God. Because God is within me, and I'm called to reveal the divinity, and I need to speak out and share what that really is, that these things are missing the mark. Now, it's not there to be in condemnation or judgment, but to love people through when we miss the mark, because we've all missed the mark. and We all are there to love and share and with great compassion to be there. Now, Jesus showed compassion on these, and he told them to do something wonderful. This, this beautiful text is so full of richness. Tells them to go to the priests. You want your healing? Go to the priest. You want this miracle to happen for you? Go to the priest. Now, that may go show yourself to the priest. Now, mind you, these are lepers, and they're unclean. And Jesus is saying, go and show you're unclean, or if you believe you're clean, Go show it to the priest. What will you show to the priest? When you walk up to the priest, will you say, look, I'm clean. Look at me. I see the goodness of God within me. I see my blessing. Or will you go to the priest and say, oh, I'm unclean. I'm unworthy. I I just don't deserve anything. I'm still living in my sickness. I'm in my dis-ease. I don't have any peace. You see, Jesus was calling for them. What is it you believe about what's happening in your life right now? What are you conscious of? Because when you go to the priest, how you will act, what you will show is really revealing what you believe. Oh, there's a lot of us who believe in the power and presence of God, but we don't act like the power and presence of God is at work within us. We're not demonstrating that power consistently. We're not acting as if. Now, here's the other beautiful symbolism in this, because what do we find throughout the scripture unfolding? Who is the priest? But we find in Hebrews, the royal priesthood is what you are. You are called to be the priest. You are called to be that one who is that revelation that all Christians are priests. In 1 Peter chapter 2, it says, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. 
to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. What's that saying? We don't need to go through anyone. We go through ourselves. We don't need to turn to someone. And what Jesus was teaching is, when you go to yourself in your own consciousness, what will you say? What will you believe? So in essence, this lesson is about when you go to the priest, when you, go to, when you come to your own self and your own consciousness and your own thinking, what does you say to yourself? Do you say, I am healed? Do you say, I am well? Do you say, I am prosperous? Do you say, I am blessed? Do you say, I am God? Do you say, I am the revelation for the world to see? Or do you say something else? Because that's the real demonstration of your faith. For as these lepers went then to the priest, one came back realizing, I need to come back and express great gratitude. I need to say, I am so grateful for what experienced in my life. I experienced a healing. We don't know the depth of what happened for the other nine, what happened within their journey. But the one who came back came to Jesus to express gratitude. Thank you for showing me the way. Thank you for pointing me the pathway to healing within my life. And that's what began to bring about a great change was this wonderful essence of gratitude in his life. Now, the interesting thing about it is, who is the one who came? A Samaritan, an outcast, one who people had said culturally were unclean. He was the Samaritan. The one who was considered the most outcast now is the one filled with the greatest gratitude. The one who was considered by the world and society to be the most, most re removed from the norms of the world and the, that which were the, the sort of A class of society now is the one who s understands the greatest power of gratitude and comes back and expresses it. And you know what happens when we are grateful? We seal the deal. Gratitude seals the deal. Because what is gratitude all about? It's gratitude that says, I am grateful for this experience. It has already happened. It is already completed. It is already finished. I'm grateful for it. I love the gratitude that we express in prayer while we're praying. You may pray for something and the answer isn't already experienced, but you know the answer is in your prayer because you're grateful for it. Do you understand that? Interestingly enough, for the answer to every one of your prayers is in your prayer. When you pray, I know God has already blessed me and I am grateful for that blessing, that's your answer. But when you pray, I'm not so sure, I don't know if God's really blessed me, but I, I will be grateful if it ever happens. That's the answer to your prayer. You said, if it ever happens. And you wonder why it doesn't happen. You see, the answer is in our prayers and the languages that we've chosen, the gratitude that we've expressed. That gratitude took him to another place because what's interesting enough is the one who did return, the one who came back to Jesus, says not only did he have a healing, but there was something more. You are whole. You get it. You get it. You're whole. Your gratitude says, I realize there's something more than just me doing this simple exercise. There's something more than this. I am grateful for it and I get it. I am the revelation of God. God is at work in me. I no longer live in the error of separation. I no longer live in this idea that I'm removed from the divine. I feel and sense the divine at work within me and that gratitude seals the deal. So let me tell you this. Here's what summarizes this text in a nutshell. On your way to Jerusalem, what is Jerusalem? Place of peace. On your way to Jerusalem, release your dis-ease. Find your healing. Our dis-ease, our disease, our dis-ease is that which we constantly celebrate in our life that says God is removed, but God is not. God is within at work, flowing through you. 
And on that passage, headed towards this place of this wonderful peace and rest, get clear that you are the I am. That which you are conscious of is what you are. That which you are aware of is that what you are. Are you aware of the power of God? You are that. If you're aware of God's divine blessing, you are that. If you're aware of God's goodness, you are that. That's what's flowing through you. When you are aware, when you're conscious, you will manifest it. It will flow through you. It will appear for you if you believe this. And move in faith in the awareness of who you are, headed and whole. I'm complete. I'm headed in this direction. I'm whole. I'm complete. And seal the deal with this gratitude that says, I know this and I'm grateful for every aspect of it. I love that. I love the fact that Jesus told the disciples, your healing happens as you believe and as you move. You move. He didn't say, sit around here, we'll all get healed in a few minutes. He said, no, you want healing? Go, go to the priest. Go, start moving. Treat and move your feet. Isn't that what we say? Pray, and as you're praying, your faith is found in your actions to move forward. And I love that. So as you're moving forward, the healing happens. There's so many Bible stories that illustrating that, that as you move out in great faith saying, I know that I am the power and presence of God at, at work right here and now. I know that I am the representative of the divinity. And when I do, I move in such a way that I am transforming the world around me. Remember the children of Israel standing at the edge of the Red Sea? Did the waters part? And they said, we're waiting for the water to split and, then, and dry up the land and then we'll move. Mm -mm. They stepped into the water and walked. And as they walked, the waters parted. It's when you believe and you act as if, when you believe and you move as if, your miracles happen for you. Here's the beautiful thing. If you believe and move as if you are the divine, the miraculous flows in, through, and around for you. How liberating. Funny thing happened on the way to the forum was the musical. A strange thing happened on the way in Jerusalem. An amazing thing happened on the way to their liberation. A beautiful healing occurred, a transition in their life as they travel through journey of life. It's available for you today. Amen.